Yeah, I went to film school out of uh, college. I went to USC and got a, uh, an MFA and got out of uh, film school, you know, having learned how to write screenplays, but nobody would hire me to do it. So I was working as a PA and a uh, production designer and stuff like that. And uh, sort of out of the blue, it's more complicated than this, but sort of out of the blue, Joe Ruby called up. He'd read a script and, uh, of Ruby Spears and said, uh, asked if I wanted to come in and work on development. And I didn't know what development was, but you know, I knew it was indoors. And, and uh, <laughs> they paid a whole lot better than slopping around on sets. So I was there. And it worked out really nicely. Um, uh, you know, we worked on shows, uh, what was it, you know, like The Puppy and Mr. T, and I, I'd never written animation before, I'd never really thought about writing animation, I was just kind of writing, you know, big action films. But back in those days, before special effects, you were either doing a, you know, hundred million dollar live action film or you were doing a animated cartoon for doing this kind of material. So that was just great. And, uh, yeah, stayed at Ruby Spears for like a year and a half. And uh, then went to uh, Lucasfilm, had disastrous experience on Droids, which was one of their Star Wars shows. There was Droids and Ewoks. And um, I, I was kind of there for yeah, a few months and then came out, had nothing to do. And um, Steve Gerber called me up and said, hey, you want to work on G.I. Joe? Because I'd worked with Steve at, at Ruby Spears. And, uh, Said, yeah, sure, that'd be great. And I sort of, I was sort of like ghost. I mean, Sunbo knew about it and everything, but I was sort of ghost story editing episodes for a while. And there, got to know Jay Bacall, who was uh, our creative director. And and so they finally asked, hey, you want to come on staff as an associate producer? And I said, yeah, this is the way. You know, it's really a lot of fun. And I started out on GI Joe and did a lot of GI Joes, and then uh, was sort of redeployed to Transformers. Um, Probably about six months later. My charter when they moved me over to, uh, from uh, G.I. Joe to Transformers was, really they just, I think they wanted to make the show a little bit older. They wanted to change the direction of it a little bit. Um, and I, this was really sort of motivated by Sunbow and by, Haz, uh, you know, really more than anybody. It's certainly not by the marketplace because the show was doing very well, you know, just fine without me. Um, and uh, went over there and, and Kind of on re-watching the episodes, I discovered, yeah, our mission was to sort of make it a little bit older and a little bit edgier. And we went in there and, and, uh, and pretty much did that. And I stayed on, I, I sort of surfed between Transformers and G.I. Joe. I'd say for the next year, it was mostly on Transformers. And then, you know, did a lot of rewrites of the movie, you know, finally. And then uh, actually, like, wrote and, you know, uh, for the third season, did a lot of writing. When we came in on the, on the show, we had to work within the mythology that had been created for the show. And for me, that's the kind of thing I love to do. I, you know, basically, at the same time, I was designing role-playing games, you know, kind of. I was working with a guy named Gary Gygax, who created Dungeons and & Dragons, and we were, you know, doing D&D uh, &D projects and interactive novels and stuff like that. And, and so I, I think I really love the mythological aspects of Transformers. And, I think that, you know, that tends to show up later on, you know, and in, in good ways and in bad ways, quite frankly, you know, but, um, you know, Jay Bacall at one point and I, and I did a, uh, a draft of the Transformer movie that we just thought was the most brilliant thing in the world. Nobody else shared our enthusiasm, but uh, we thought it was really brilliant. And it was all about the mythology and it was about the secret of Cybertron and bits and pieces of it made it back into the, the real Transformer movie. Um, but we really, we really worked hard to figure out the mythology. I mean, we decided that Cybertron itself was a giant robot and, you know, so on. But um, so I, I like the mythological aspects of it, and I like the relationship between the characters and, and, you know, the origin story and where they were going and all that. Hasbro, you couldn't ask for a better client. You know, you know a, a guy named Bob Prupus was running Boys Toys at that point, and Bob was just, a, he, he was really just kind of the perfect guy. I mean, you know, I, like, Invited to my wedding, you know, 10 years later, it was so much fun to work with. Um, their, Hasbro's attitude really was they wanted to see their toys presented in the most fun and best possible way they could. And it was our job to make up cool stories. And, and they really were incredibly unobtrusive. And I probably will never experience the creative freedom again that we had there. 
it was I mean, there were rules and you know this is a children's children's TV show and there are rules to what you can and can't do and those rules existed then um, but as long as we didn't you know, have a lot of disembowelings and stuff like that, Hasbro didn't really much care, or care what we did. Uh, that was until we killed Optimus Prime, but that's, that's a different story. Transformers and G.I. Joe were unabashedly what were called toy shows. You know, it was a phenomenon of the, of the mid-80s, and there, was no, there were no bones made about that. that we were, um, our job was to present the toys and exciting you know, play patterns and adventures, adventures for the viewers. And to that end, um, Hasbro, in the early days, they would give us a list of characters they wanted to use in each episode. That didn't mean we couldn't use other characters too, it just meant we had to feature each of those characters had to have a hero moment. Um, and later on, it, it seems to me that kind of dropped off, but we or we would hear a character was discontinued, so we'd you know substitute another character in a particular story. Sometimes that would happen later later on. It was an interesting creative exercise, um, but it, it, yeah, it was unabashedly. You know, we all knew what the rules were. That we're doing a you know the agenda is we're selling toys, and this is a half hour commercial. I don't think people would have phrased it that way, and nobody ever put it to me that way. But I mean that's that's the way we thought of it. But that having been said. There was an amazing amount of creative freedom. There was no network giving you notes. There was no broadcast standards and practices giving us notes. Um, it, frankly, Hasbro was really pretty invisible to the process. Just given our the, our our agenda and what our job was, they were they were you know they were just great. They were kind of around. They'd send us free toys and send us cool drawings and tell us we were doing a real good job and basically left us our own, our own devices. Prime Target, yeah, which is, which is included in the set, was really, if not the only, one of the few shows that I actually wrote that season. I wrote it with Buzz Dixon. And it's simultaneously kind of familiar and a bizarre story. Um, I, I was kind of fascinated by the idea because I didn't think we made enough of the fact that these, the Transformers are all disguised as, as cars and things like that. And I was trying to fascinated by all the different devices you could build in a city to trap cars. And, you know, I, I sort of wanted to get that in. And the episode more or less built itself off of, uh, off of um, trying to get that stuff in. And then we came up with the, just the idea that there'd be a big game hunter hunting for Optimus Prime. You know, he'd like, you know, hunted for airplanes and he'd hunted for tanks and he'd hunted for helicopters and now he was gonna get the head Autobot. Um, and that, that's really where the episode came from. Buzz, yeah, I think, added a lot of the fun to it, making him this kind of, you know, old English type, uh, um, you know, big game hunter and, you know, adding the goofy sidekick to him and all that, which ended up, I think, being fun. But that was a real impulse. And what was funny with both Transformers in that era and G.I. Joe simultaneously was I tended to write weird episodes because I edited so many normal ones that I, I was always trying to write an episode that went and did something that uh, other episodes di you know, didn't do. I remember Jay Bacall calling one time and saying, hey, you know, I'd like to see a Joe episode where they don't blow up the Cobra headquarters at the end, you know? So, you know, that's, you know, we did two like that. I wrote uh, a prime target with, with Buzz Dixon, and I've, I, actually, the truth is, my relation with Buzz goes back literally to the first day in the anime, my first day in the animation business, and that was when uh, Joe Ruby hired me. And I went into his office and he said, introduced me to Buzz, and he said, hi, this is Buzz, I want you two guys to work on a, on a concept. And so we went out to the local coffee shop and Joe told us what he, he wanted us to do. And we created a thing called Cyberforce. There's later a product called Cyberforce that had nothing to do with this. Well, we thought it was just the most <laughs> brilliant thing in the world. and. Uh, and uh, really pitched Joe hard, and he just like didn't like the idea. And the next day, he said, "Now you have to understand, you know, it's like you come up with an idea, but you're not supposed to fall in love with it. You just, you know, you just, uh, you know, come up with a bunch of different takes." And it was actually great advice. You know, I've you know, ever since then I've kind of learned to, you know, if, if the idea is kind of vague, you come up with the different takes. But uh, but anyway, back to Buzz. Um, yeah, Buzz and I worked together at Ruby Spears, and then we worked together, you know, on uh, 
Transformers, we did this episode, and Buzz did a lot of stuff on G.I. Joe. And uh, as recently as this year, we worked together on the Terminator video game. I mean, it's, it's kind of a long relationship, and we've always uh, kind of written well together. My recollection of, the, of sort of the, the transformance of Transformers is it started out season one, it, was, it seemed to me most of the time it was very Earth-based, and it was a, a slightly younger show. Um, there was a lot of interaction between human characters. There was a kid, Spike, who was involved with the Transformers a lot. And about the time I came on, I think that Sunbow felt that they had kind of run that, that well dry, and they wanted to expand the show to create different kinds of stories, make it a little more science fiction-y. I think I could be wrong about this, but I think Go Butts had come out somewhere around that period. And they were, they were chiseling away at the younger market, and I think that was part of the impetus to move Transformers to an older show. I'm just guessing on that. I don't really, don't really remember. I don't think anybody told me that. I think that's, that was my sense. Um, and I, you know, Joe and, and Tom, Joe Bacall and Tom Griffin, um, I think really wanted it to, uh, to have a little bit more of an edge to it. And, and the guys who had been story editing, Bryce and Dick, had done a really good job. And it's one of those things in retrospect I realized how good a job. Because what they did is they really established the, uh, the series. They really you know, got it going. And we look at it now and it's, you know, it seems like a pretty obvious series to do. But at the time, nobody had ever really done a series with 130 main characters in it before. And so it was quite a challenge. By the time season two came along, and by the time when I was brought on, we sort of tried to just transition it. And, and early it was in subtle ways. The dialogue got a little bit harder. The uh, fights became a little more uh, visceral, I would imagine. The plots became a little more complex. Um, there were certain things that had become kind of uh, stock things in the show that we got rid of. We didn't want to use a lot of holograms, though I did notice I used a hologram in uh, Prime Target. Um, and, and we just, we wanted to make it a little bit older. At the end of season two, we knew we were getting ready for the, for the uh, movie. And so a lot of things became biased, became informed by what we were going to do in the movie. And what we knew in the movie was we were going to do things like, you know, kill Optimus Prime and wipe out the entire 85 toy line and and stuff like that. And uh, so we had to, we wanted to sort of move the series in a way that that wouldn't be just totally out of the blue, that the movie would seem like part of the flesh of the series. And then by season three, a number of weird things had happened by season three. The, the Transformers themselves had become a lot more abstract. If you look at the characters in the movie, you know, where the first season and early Transformers were clearly, this is a Ferrari, you know, this is an airplane, this is, you know, this is, most specifically, this is an F-16, and the whole gag with Transformers was that they looked like a toy, and it was very cool and secret that it turned into a robot. By season three, they were into triple changers and Dinobots, and, you know, the triple changers, were, sorry, we referred to them as, this is a, huh? That turns into a what? <laughs> you know, um, and you know, it became much more science fictiony, and kind of with it was the series. And I, you know, it, in some ways, you know, at both levels, both of the toy and the show, we might have gone too far in the third, by the third season. We lost the simple charm of Transformers being these things that live on Earth, and they're living here secretly, and they're disguised as cars, and you know, your family's car might well transform into something else. We just, we ditched that all together, and a lot more of the stories went in deep to the, into the Transformer mythology, and, and really broke away from that. And I think we very rarely went back to Earth, and when we did, we went, we did it a whole different level. Uh, and there's, there's a plus and a minus to it. At one level, the, the series is progressing and changing, and you don't end up with 270 episodes that all feel the same way. At a number, you know, you, when, you, when you get more sophisticated and more science fiction, you're trading away some of the more charming, basic aspects to it. And I guess the good news is that now all of those things exist for whatever the, the viewers like. Um, <clears throat> the bad news is you almost have to watch them on a seasonal basis. I think we, we ended up being a lot more about continuity as the series went on. I think we were, we were doing something that now almost every TV show does now, which is it's, it's a self-contained episode, but there's a, kind of an arc that goes over the course of the season. 
And I think we were very concerned about that, doing that later on, whereas I don't think that was, you know, the, the first season was very much a reset show. You know, by the end of the first show, the Decepticons are in their secret headquarters, the the you know, Autobots are in their secret headquarters, and uh, uh, the next episode starts with a blank slate. And we, we kind of broke away from that somewhere around the middle of the second season. A lot of people have asked why why do you think, because I mean, it's something you ask yourself. Whenever you, Transformers was a phenomenon, and, and uh, uh, Carol Monroe at Hasbro told me it was the highest selling toy line of all time. And, you know, I didn't, you know, uh, you know and, and obviously, if we knew what made a super successful phenomenon, we'd be doing that every week. Um, I think that the Transformers was a lot of stuff. It, it was, first of all, it was a really unique idea. I remember the first time I, you know, I went to, Japan town, you know, and, and bought one of these, just a little car that turned into a robot, and I, you know, I was kind of fascinated by it, you know, and I was I was in my 20s at that point. I wasn't even a kid. There's something fascinating about it. I mean, the the toy itself is pretty brilliant because it's a vehicle. <coughs> excuse me, it's a vehicle, it's a character, and it's a construction toy all at the same time, and that's a huge, you know, combination. You know, you know, that's to have three different play patterns in one toy is 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 great and you know it's kind of a puzzle you know on top of that um, I think the show did just because it was so different than anything anybody was seeing at that point uh, nobody had really seen a lot of anime style stuff not in the you know in mainstream or you know you know Japanese influenced uh, shows at, at that point um, nobody really seen a lot of action shows the so one thing the toy shows brought in in the mid 80s was a lot of action and adventure because before that for many years uh, you know, children's television and, and, in fact, animation, with feature animation, was dead. And, uh, you know, network animation was really politically correct. I mean, the, you know, the, the networks in that point basically wrote the book for political correctness. And, they, you know, and every, every, you know, form that takes, you know, there were anti-violence, they were... Anti you know, and, and violence in both forms, not just imitatable action, which is you don't want to, you know, have a character put a cape over his head and jump off a roof. Um, but it, they were just philosophically against violence. And uh, I think that, you know, Transformers and Joe came along and, and they had a whole different attitude and octane and that was appealing. In order to do this interview, uh, you know, I watched a, I watched a few of the episodes. Um, you know, it was fun. They were really kind of fun to watch, and it would be, you know, impossible for me to separate my own personal emotions and kind of memories of that period of my life, which is a period I remember very fondly, uh, from the actual content that I was watching. You know, I have no idea whether the, uh, um, you know, the shows were any good or not. Though, as I was watching with a certain amount of distance and objectivity, there's a kind of kind of sort of just fun and joy to them, which, you know, reflects the, the, the kind of the mood when we were doing it. That's not to say that there weren't, you know, horrible fights and arguments and people going 16 rounds over, you know, whether, you know, Starscream should, uh, you know, say a certain line or not. But it was just, you know, we had an office in Westwood and we had, you know, a lot of fun people working in the office and it was just a good period. Um, the, uh, um, so, I mean, you know, there's that side of me, and then there's the side of me objectively watching it. One thing it has, you know, that's different from when, you know, later on I went on, you know, and wrote a lot of movies and, and, uh, and um, you know, doing a lot of video games now, and I'm you know, back writing movies kind of. But one thing that's really great about working on, on series television, especially the kind of shows we were doing then where we get, you know, you get an order for 130 episodes for a year, is you could try a lot of different things. It was the ultimate film school. We'd just get an idea and you'd go write it as a script and we knew the characters and we knew the world and we'd write it and, and you know, we were bound by certain rules. You know, all the acts had to be basically seven, you know, seven plus minutes long and, you know, so we had to have a, you know, a strong three act structure and we had templates and, and all that for, for structure. but. You got to try a lot of experiments. You got to break a lot of rules. <clears throat> you know, sometimes by design, sometimes out of necessity. Sometimes we'd, um, um, you know, wouldn't get the proper footage back. You know, you'd be like missing a couple minutes, or we'd sort of have to invent a couple minutes of the episode or stuff like that. So, but the point is, is that 
you know, never before and maybe never again has there been this opportunity to have 130 you know, shots at doing something and, and sort of taking your characters you know, literally out for a drive 130 times and having them do different things. And you know, some episodes you get them back, you know, ooh. You know, but oddly enough, those aren't necessarily fan, the episodes that fans don't like. And some episodes you get back and you'd be really proud of and think, this is really cool, let's do more of that. And so it was, it was a great, you know, environment to work in.